Uh, it's an honor for me to be here today, believe me. And I'd love to have a show of hands as to who might be a descendant of the Arab people here today. So um, I'm sure you all know by now that the uh, reason there were so many immigrants from the Arab is because of the al copper mines, where they had rock mining from 1812 to 1880 when Marcus came to town here. So some of the background to that, uh, those mines had to do with an honorable Cromwell came to Ireland uh, in around 18, uh, 1648, 1650. And Cromwell, of course, uh, ransacked the country. And he paid his troops with parcels of land. And one of the heirs of Galway acquired the rights to that parcel of land, which was in Beira. And they sent down two brothers to oversee the land, to collect rent and dues from the farmers whose land they had taken away. And their names were Puxleys, two Puxley brothers. So it was the Puxley's descendants that uh, discovered the copper in Allegheny and mined it successfully. It was probably the, one of the richest copper mines in Western Europe. So um, in the kitchen of the house where I was born and raised, the farmhouse, there was a large framed image of the Sacred Heart with the, the, the candle lit at all times underneath it. On the opposite wall, there was an image of a portrait of the Irish visionary poet and uh, patriot, Paulic Pierce. And on a third wall, in its own little shelf, there was a clock that my grandfather brought from Butte, Montana. It was about that size. And <clears throat> my father wound that clock every Saturday night. It was an eight-day clock. And it had a beautiful sound to it. It sounded off the hours and binged the half hours. So he'd take the key and he'd slide it into the clock in a manner where he'd look around and see if there was anybody watching. It was really saying, you know, this is private, this is important. Keep away from this. The clock is still there. It doesn't run anymore, but it's still there. Other items in the house were uh, a miner's candle holder that my grandfather also brought back on his one trip back home, which was in around um, 1913 or 14, we think. Uh, another item was this here letter opener which I use all the time. Came back from Butte, you can take a look at it, pass it around. And um, there were two pocket watches that he brought back. One was a silver colored one, and the other was a golden colored one. And um, I brought the gold colored one to Boston one time and I had it repaired and brought it back to my father. He says, you keep that down. It was a watch that my grandfather wore. And this is it. Same watch. Different era. Upstairs, there was a trunk, which was kept on the lock and key at all times. And, um, my sister and I were fascinated by this. What could be in it? And we were figuring it had to be candy. <laughs> it had to be lucky bags. And there had to be a section of it which would have chocolate. So one day, we found the key, and we raided the box. <laughs> so I wrote a little story describing that. And it's called The Letters. Locked at the foot of their bed, the brown wooden trunk was off limits to us children, making the contents more curious and otherworldly. When we found the key, we waited till they were in town. The barrel shaped lid lifted to a scatter of letters and mothballs. 
Was it the scent of camphor or the penmanship they were keeping from us? The words Butte Montana on the letterhead, November 22nd, 1918, matched the talk of copper, pocket watch, chain and locket, the set Thomas clock that told the hours. We closed the trunk, back the key. Sensing the loss they were protecting us from, the uncle spirit in butte, the father in Phoenix. So in the front of our house, the land slopes, slopes up and there are two houses there, six or seven hundred yards away. The one on the left is Dunn's and their ancestor was here last week, young John Dunn. And the others were uh, Dunnevins. So those were the people I grew up with, but I didn't realize until later that the Dunn's grandparents, grandfather and grandmother, met and married here in Butte and went back farming. They built a beautiful house, classy looking lions facing south, stands out. Dunnevins, um, he went back uh, and died shortly afterwards. And he, the, the neighbor said, he bought too much of you back with him. <laughs> and, uh, suggesting that he's the Romans. At the back of the house, there was a family of Dwyer and two Halling families. Uh, the Dwyer family, Catherine Dwyer, the oldest of that family, moved here to Butte and she married a man by the name of Cunningham. And I understand their son, Skip Cunningham, became sheriff here in Butte. Is that right? Does anybody remember that? Rock Cunningham. Kim. Okay. Yeah, Rock. Rock. That's yeah. right. And their daughter, um, the daughter Patricia, <coughs> became Patricia Walsh. Mm -hmm. I met her here several times. Another, the other Harrington family that was there, um, Reggie Harrington. Reggie Harrington was the first man in the area to have a tractor. So he'd come around and cut the hay for my father. And in the fall, he had a threshing machine. And uh, all the neighbors would get, would get together and thresh the barley and the oats. And there was, it was a mill system. The Irish word mill, which means that the farmers would get together. They'd all work on one farm today. They'd go to the next farm tomorrow, do all that work. And it was helpful because of the weather, you know. He took advantage of the good day. <clears throat> but that man worked so hard, from dawn until dark, every day, mowing hay. He'd take a nap under the tractor at no time, and maybe have some to eat. But when he came to my father, it was my daughter, Jennifer. Woo -hoo! <laughs> <laughs> take a seat down there, Jennifer. Go ahead. When he came to my father, they would sit and talk. And I would admire the walkings of the tractor, and they'd be talking. And they talked about Butte, Montana. <clears throat> a busy man, he would take time out and spend a half hour talking about you to my father. I since discovered that in that family there were three generations of 11 children. Uh, in the older generation, one of the men came here and he bought a ranch. He had a ranch somewhere here in Butte. And one evening, the Native Americans took his horses. So he pursued them, and it seems apparently one of them liked his head of hair. <laughs> so he didn't survive that. <laughs> but that didn't keep his, his, uh, the next generation from coming here. Uh, there were uh, five or six of those Harringtons came here to do mining, and three of the brothers died in three separate mining accidents. <clears throat> the other um, family there was also Harrington. They were called Harringtons the Grove. And they were they did one better. They had twelve in the family. <laughs> but only once, only one generation. So one of those uh, for some reason survived the mines here in Butte and became an old man with gray hair, so they called him Gray Dan. Mm -hmm. 
better we heard him a while back. So what was special about that family was they had this shelter built, planted to the southwest of their house for shelter from the prevailing wind. And inside of that was a beautiful orchard. So my beautiful mother, God love her, would give me a half crown or two shilling piece to go and get a big bag of cooking apples. And I'd bring them home and I'll tell you, when that hot, hot apple pie landed on the table, I didn't wasn't too concerned about the colour of Dan's hair. <laughs> Uh, I often wonder, was it, was it an antidote to silicosis? <laughs> so in 1955, my older sister Maureen immigrated to Boston. And we realized firsthand the impact of immigration in our house. There was no communication for 40 something years from when my grandfather died until my sister Maureen came out to Boston. But we started crying about a week in advance. And we cried every night. We cried all day long, take her to Shannon. And we saw her way up the steps onto the plane. <laughs> and we cried for another week after. <clears throat> I'm telling you this because of the impact of immigration on the people that are left behind. And the generation before that, you know, had less to rely on. And you know, the, the upheaval, the emotional upheaval of leaving, especially a community like Vera, where everybody is very close knit. In Vera, the south way is 30 miles to Bantry, the north road is 30 miles to Kenmare. So it's a narrow peninsula with a high ridge of mountains going through the middle, the Caja Mountains. And it, they're very close. It's practically an island community. All the uh, mannerisms of an island people are so close to the day. So to leave that community and knowing that nobody had ever come back and survived this, you know, when people left for America and the up to the 50s, they were not coming back. So um, I have two poems I want to read that refer to the effects of immigration. <coughs> um, one is, scratch, this scratches the surface. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, Farewell to the Farm. The coach is out the door at last. The, this is uh, a family that had spent the summer in the farm. So it's, it's not that they were leaving for good. The coach is at the door at last, the eager children mounting fast, and kissing hands and chorus sing goodbye, goodbye to everything. To house and garden, feed and lawn, the meadow gates we swang upon. To a pump and stable, tree and swing, goodbye, goodbye to everything. And fare you well forevermore, O lather at the hayloft door, O hayloft where the cobwebs cling, goodbye, goodbye to everything. Crack goes the whip and off we go, the trees and houses smaller grow, last round the woody turn we sing, goodbye, goodbye to everything. And then there was, there was this um, trolley man from Castleton Bear, uh, who immigrated to this country with his friend Robard. And um, he described the pain of immigration more accurately. He got to the, to the boat. So uh, they came to Boston, they traveled across the country, they went to the West Coast. Robard went home, lived out his life passed died at home. And at the end of um, Tony's days, he went back and visited to visit Vera. This is a little bit long, but I think I'd like to read it all because it tells us the story well. It's called Rebar. I envy thee thy lot, Rebar, 
and consecrated earth. Thou sleepest neath the shamrock's war in thine own land of earth. And after years of exile spent, and far in the golden west, thy motherland doth fold thee fond to her enraptured breast. Those songbirds dearly loved in youth make vibrant all the air. The flora of the sunny south is round thee everywhere. And the river of the valley we roamed when we were free, when young and free, the Kishta chants thy requiem ere it murmurs to the sea. While in a clime where winter grim a long, long vigil keeps, far from his home, thy bosom friend, the noble Dermot, sleeps. <clears throat> and I, a pilgrim, bent beneath a weary weight of years, am left of that triumvirate to roam this fair of tears. In early youth we left our home, impelled by dangers grim, and sought the land of Massasoit, beyond the ocean's rim. Then, lured by lust of gold and fame, we traversed fields of hard, until we reached the coast beneath the bright Hesperian star. And there, amid the sunset slopes, came bright and happy days, until, alas, the fates decreed a parting of our ways. Dost know that I, he said, do you realize, do you know that I return once more with tear-dimmed eyes today, intone my miserere or thy tenement of clay? <sighs> Rest calmly by the kistas wave the, the sordid ones of earth, who kneel beside thy hallowed grave, can ill appraise thy worth. They little knew the wealth of love, the purpose pure and high, that deep within thy bosom stole in summer days gone by. With all the constancy of fate, you wrought to, rave, to raise this land, high to her former proud estate among the nations grand. A, the patriot order of thy soul, of mine was fondly set. The exile's cares of forty years have not faced it yet. Farewell, reward for I, farewell, reward adieu, for I, far from the kistas wail, must find beneath some foreign sky a mute, unlettered grave. When we shall meet, my friend of yore, philosopher and guide, where kindred spirits part no more. Beyond the great divide. Mm -hmm. he, got, he, be, he became a, pre, a priest. <coughs> he studied for the priest and became a priest and established a safe house for children in uh, San Francisco. And there's a park there called Father Crowley Park. Mm -hmm. So, um, A few years after I came to this country, I um, drove across country and um, I found my grandfather's grave in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, beautifully, beautifully landscaped place with um, palm trees and warm weather. And I'm looking at this plot of ground and a couple of headstones scattered around and nothing happened. So I realized then that his spirit was not there. It was here, the mute. <laughs> so um, I read David Inman's book, The Beaut Irish, and uh, life got in the way. I didn't get here as soon as I expected. Um, we raised three fabulous women and educated them. And um, eventually, in uh, 75, 1975, I had some time and I decided I was going to come to you. <clears throat> I called my nephew, Roger Regan, asked him if he'd be interested. He said, uh, whenever you're ready, Uncle Michael, I'll go with you. <laughs> and then I called my brother, Pat, who was usually out for anything, and Pat said, hold on till I get my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we arrived down here in Bethune Airport, uh, 
on the fourth week of July. Beautiful weather and beautiful, so beautiful at night. And then I walked out onto the grass. And the first sense I got of beauty was the smell of blasted rock. You know, my father and I, we had blasted a rock back home. We came here feed. And I had the drip turning it. And he's walloping from the sledgehammer. And I'm saying, I'm going to use one hand or two here. Uh, and we, we, we blew the rock. And that smell, I had never realized it would stay in my memory. And I felt the connection between my father, my grandfather, right there in the airport that night. So the first. Um, one we went to visit with John the Yank and Johnny Sullivan. <clears throat> we met Tom Mulcahy uh, and Tom took us out of the town. We visited quite a number of establishments. <laughs> we went late into the night and into the early hours of the morning. <laughs> and we met up for breakfast at the m, &M. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to see and meet Father Sassman and his sister, so he brought us up there. And uh, I thought he'd come in, but no, he left. We walked in, there's a street dining room, and the, the frame was in Sunday morning, and there were four or five people on the table, so we rushed in silently and we took our seats. And about 20 minutes went by, and Father Sassman said, and now we have the Mass. <laughs> In the course of the Mass, as usual, you know, the host was, was passed along and the chalice, and I don't partake of the chalice, but my brother seemed to hold on to it a bit longer. <laughs> when he got to me, it was drained. <laughs> <laughs> we went back into the living room of Father Sarsfield that day, and we and the stories began from Father Sarsfield and his sister Bernie. And he would, she would step in and correct it. No, it wasn't 1936. You were right, love, it was 1936. <laughs> so um, that's where I learned about you, Father Sarsfield. <laughs> Sister Sarsfield was, was kind of uh, delicate growing up. You know, he had a big strong voice, but he wasn't that strong. I'm sure you all knew him. And um, they were picking teams from the, when the captain would pick teams. Uh, they wouldn't ignore Sarsfield. And it was like, uh, you can have Sarsfield. No, we had Sarsfield yesterday. You can have Sarsfield. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't mind my I went home and my father's books were piled up and down the stairs, up to the ceiling in the bedrooms, and I didn't know all this. Gurney <laughs> then was out one night. <clears throat> she said she was more experienced. She didn't say she was older, she was more experienced. She was out one night and some lady next door stuck her head out and she asked her how old she was. Gurney ignored her. It happened again. And Gurney said, you know, if you'll forgive me for not answering, I'll forgive you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> there was always, uh, <clears throat> uh, Sasha, we had the joke about the donkey. There was some priest that arrived there. Was it Joey McDonough or something? He, I was in a Nagar priest. He came to take over a parish and woke up in the morning and looked out. There was a dead donkey on the pathway. So he called the police station, and the story goes that it was George Wise picked up the phone. And when he heard the story, he, he figured he'd have a little fun with the priest. So he said, well, isn't that your department, Father? The last rites and scuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <he's, clears throat> the priest said, no, I'm just calling to notify the next of kin. <laughs> So, um, another little poem here has to do with immigration. Uh, on Irish American shoulders. It's simple, it's complex, it's powerful. What analogy or metaphor will explain it? To be Irish and American, 
in Butte. Look at that Boston Butte, what can I say Butte? From the old building. Its uniqueness, its beauty, its depth, its leadership, its compassion, its timelessness. It is individual diversity seeking unity, a cause for unity, something to love together. It raises our sights, it moves us, it is emotional. It is two cultures achieving what neither one can do alone. Its time has come. I feel great hope. Yours is a big American heart. Familiarity. Yes, I could make my home among you, and I will learn your ways. I will sow on your land, and you will help me reap. And mine will be the silent shoulder, of yours will be the sound. Together we will strike a tune our renaissance has found. Our children on our, shoulder, on our shoulders sit, the better to survey their individual paths they find as we on backs surveyed. <coughs> so around uh, 1888, my, old, my grandfather's older brother, Mike Dwyer, came to Butte first landed in the East Coast and New Bedford and had to walk there to earn the $25 train fare to Butte. He got here in 1889, got a job in the diamond mine. <coughs> I should do something with this. <laughs> Here's Sarsfield and Bernie and myself and my nephew Roger Regan who since passed away. You know those three characters? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mike Dwyer, walking in the diamond mine, brought out his brother, Patrick. Got him a job. And then comes Mary. And Mary married a man from New Jersey and moved back to New Jersey. And they had four children, and we are tracking them down. I should say, my cousin Patrick Sullivan from California with him too. This big time has given me all this information from my ancestors, which I wouldn't have a clue about Patrick Sullivan. He is the grandson of Mike Dwyer. So Patrick came out and we don't know what happened to him. Nora came out and she married a Murphy man and they had four children <clears throat> and she ran a boarding house which is up over the uh, Harrington Surgical store. It was two floors up there. She ran a boarding house there for the miners. And she kept her, her brother and uh, her wife's brother among, among the others. So her husband, Murphy, uh, seemed to have a midlife crisis and he took off. And some years later, um, Nora <coughs> suffered a burst appendix and died. Oh, so the orphans were transferred up to Missoula to the Safe Heart Institution, paid for by Mike Dwyer, and uh, we're still tracking those people down. That was Nora. Then there was Kat, Kathy, or Kate. Kate came here and she married a man from Mayo. What was his name? Um, he'll come to me. But well, he worked in the Wares mine. And uh, he and a friend of his, McAndrews, were at the head of the mine one day in the cage when the eight inch cable snapped. And the boat fell 2,000 feet into 300 feet of water. <coughs> so Kate was a widow at 29. And the peculiar thing happened this summer. I was home in Ireland, and my nephew John Ant, John Dwyer got an email from a lady who knew a descendant of this Kate Dwyer. And she said that she had children, which we didn't know about. And that she was remarried and that she was murdered. So this passage, someone has checked that out. It's 
too much death and, and destruction here for my daughter. <laughs> she shakes her head. <laughs> Uh, so that was um, the look. What else do we have? Nora, Mary, Addy, then Tim. Tim came out and became a prospector and he traveled around. And we have a letter from Tim from the Black Forest, Nevada, sending home money for the Dunnermans and the neighbors, the you know, O'Neills, to have a drink on him. He said he had a sore on his face. It seemed like it was cancerous and it was the last we heard of him. We don't know where he is. Died with his boots on, we assume. So then, uh, around 1910, my grandfather, Johnny Dwyer, came out. At that time, um, Mike was in the, in the police force here, and he was a lieutenant in 1919. Mike was a lieutenant. Murphy, his relative, was a jailer. And Joe the Wise, the chief of police, 1911. So Tim came out, and that was Tim. We don't know where he went. Yeah, following up on my, my grandfather now. He came here, and he walked, I believe, in the mountain con, which is, as you know, the deepest mine in Butte. And um, I had a picture of him, but uh, enough of it. it might not be able to go back to it. Here he is. I think you can see from his fingers that he wasn't a pencil pusher. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he got the, the dirtiest job, bucking, as they call it, in the deepest part of the mine. <clears throat> so he went home once, and I asked my father. It occurred to me that my father didn't know who his father was. And I asked him, and he said, the answer he gave me was, I remember a man coming to the house one time. And that was all. So, when the Spastic Sullivan arrived in my father's doorstep in 1976, he was the nephew, he was the grandson of Mike Dwyer. And it was, my father said the circle had been complete when he arrived. So Johnny Dwyer worked there and went home once, came back here, and in 1918, or thereabouts, went off down to Phoenix, Arizona. The air was supposed to be good for people with this disease, but um, he died there and was buried there. And uh, Mike Dwyer wrote a beautiful letter back to his wife, um, telling him of that and that he had no money on him at the time, but he had come up with the mining stock that was worth four hundred dollars, and he sent that back. <coughs> then um, that was him. Mike Dwyer then went actually to the condo. In, 19, in 1897, and having some experience in mining, he got, took three claims there and sold them off to the big mining industry. Came back and he, he bought a saloon in the Mullen House. Um, I don't know if you remember the Mullen House, it's probably gone for years. I don't even know where it was. But I know, I know they sell 300 meals a day there, and, uh, and the miners would, um, they had obviously. Uh, two or three hundred miners living there. Um, so, yeah, he came back there and he bought that place. And uh, then he, uh, there was a house for sale down here in Harrison Avenue, 1604 Harrison Avenue. It was owned by the guy who had a brewery across the road. What's the name that beer gentleman we talked about the other day? That the guy in Butte started. So he had a good swiss house and he was selling it for Mike to work the house. And that's where he lived, 1406 Harrison Avenue. I think the um, Civic Center might be there now. So um, I'm going to finish off with one more poem, and that has to do with uh, you know, the um, success of the immigrants. So arriving in this country, to me, it is a second birthday. So I say, second birthday, passport stamp, mirrored coastline forested. Fresh faces, spaces, sounds, and light, alarming siren calls at night. No personal history known or shown. A handshake and an open eye. Life skills transfer. The Gaelic soul 
Your slate is clean by silent toll. Begin again, the instinct urged, in winter's grey and frozen ground. A phrase, a chord, a whistled sound, as in deep woods a compass found. The void of sudden waning filled by youth's eternal promise willed. The babies cry, or parents die, an unsupported overload get by. Now on firm feet they stand by cultural citizens of each land. In towns and cities to each state, a proud inheritance they rate. As varied on-ramp traffic merge on highways cut from sea to sea, their individual colors hold a living, moving mosaic mold. There's one more quote I want to give. When Mary McAleese opened the Irish Cultural Centre in Montana, she said, those who now draw the water should remember those who dug the wells. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. <laughs>